Welcome to GUI and in web browsers and connectivity. Uh, we click call for 25th of March 2020. Uh, this week, everyone is at home, apart from Hug. And, and the first topic is uh, the preview of subdomain gateway support in IPFS Companion. So, uh, this week I released a beta, a beta with a preview of uh, support for those subdomain gateways. I probably talked what subdomain gateway is multiple times. So uh, I will just uh, point at our new docs website. And there is an uh, address IPFS anti web article with HTTP gateway section with description of what are path gateways, what are subdomain gateways, and DNS link gateways. So, uh, that being said, in Go IPFS uh, 0.5, the, nat the native support for subdomain gateway will land. And that means uh, it's time for IPFS Companion to leverage that. Uh, for right now, uh, if you stumble upon uh, IPFS resource on the web, it will be redirected to a local gateway uh, using a path. So it will look something like this, uh, local host and then IPFS path. So what subdomains uh, do uh, are first, you need to run uh, Go IPFS in version 0.5. Uh, this is a version from last Friday. It will ship eventually. So if you want to test this, you need to run uh, this test version. Uh, and if you run that version of GoIPFS and you have this beta version of IPFS Companion and try to load a CID from a path, let's open this one. Uh, so we can see instead of opening uh, that on a path, it landed in a subdomain here, which is pretty cool because it's one content identifier first, then you know it's IPFS, then you know it's on localhost. What else do you need? Uh, so uh, what's happened here is this is CIDV0. And when I opened that, it automatically got redirected to a subdomain and the CID got upgraded to CIDV1. So it means the subdomain gateway on a local host is a drop-in drop replacement. It will handle all the requests that would go to a regular path gateway. It will just upgrade uh, everything and redirect to like separate origin per content route. Uh, those identifiers are pretty cool, however, um, we have a public subdomain gateways. So what we now do, in the past we did not redirect those things because we did not want to break origin isolation. But now that we have origin isolation on a local host, if you open a subdomain gateway link on a, from a public internet, in this case it's on the dweb link, uh, this uh, resource will be opened from a local gateway. Uh, and you can see that the slash wiki is at the very root. So it's finally the content root, which is indicated here, uh, is the same, the content root uh, of IPFS uh, resource is the same as the root path of the URL. Uh, and inter interesting like, side effect of this is if we have a DNS link website, Historically, we were not able, like we are not, we were able and we did that, but it was uh, breaking origin isolation of a website. So if you opened a DNS link website, for example, this Wikipedia mirror, it has a DNS link. And if you opened it, it would open uh, a path, uh, putting all websites in the same uh, origin sandbox. Now, when you open a DNS link, it will open, however, it will open on its own origin, which is pretty cool side effect. So when you browse the web uh, with IPFS Companion enabled, 
after Go IPFS uh, 0.5 ships, uh, and you stumble upon a host name which has a DNS link, you may not even notice because like you look only at the beginning of the address bar and you get the original host name here. And then you see, oh, that host name was loaded over IP, like IPNS uh, endpoint uh, from a local host gateway. And then you get the correct path. So that means also if you are creating a website with static website generator, which does not support uh, relative paths, that problem goes away. Um, pretty, pretty cool. And if you want to like <laughs> share, you don't like, of course you can like remove that part and now copy and share. However, uh, here in the address, uh, under browser action, I've been told people don't know this. So I will need, like I will explicitly show this. If you are on, uh, a local host website with this URL here and you want to copy the URL for sharing with someone you go here and you copy public gateway URL and you can see the URL copied to the clipboard is just a regular it will be either a re original URL for the NS link website or it will be a URL to IPFS resource at the public gateway so you can share it with people who don't have IPFS companion, don't have IPFS at all, and it will still load from a public gateway. Uh, that's just a tangent. The key announcement here is uh, this will happen soon. I just need to squash some bugs. So if you want to test, you can install it uh, in Firefox today. Uh, if you want to test that in Chromium-based web browser, you Unfortunately, you need to manually download uh, zip and uh, load it because uh, Chrome Web Store, for a, even for a beta channel, it takes a week for to publish, which is ridiculous for a beta channel. So um, if you find a bug, please feel an issue. It will be super useful. Uh, it's a pretty, like it, it looks like a small change, but it's a pretty big change given that and companion Companion is pretty old software. It started around like 2016 and it's been like rewritten fully at least once. And during this uh, entire history, we operated on those paths. So there may be a lot of like code paths where we only recognize paths and we ignore subdomains. Uh, so if anything looks weird, uh, just it, it's expected. Let me know, I'll try to fix it. Uh, I think that's it for, for this. Any questions? Uh, so that's awesome to see this completing after the core go IPFS work. I added a bunch of questions in the in the notes. Will docs of path gateways be marked as deprecated slash unsafe feature? Very good question. No, it's uh, the path gateways will still exist and I, the way we look at this is uh, you you use subdomain gateway only when you load IPFS content in a web browser. It, a lot of people may use IPFS in context which are we, we, in HTTP context which are not for being consumed by browser. For example, if you you uh, use uh, wget or curl, uh, that will continue to work. And it will continue to work even with subdomain gateway. We've made it so uh, the request, uh, even, even though Carl does not follow redirects to subdomains, we are, we are able to return the proper payload. So uh, we will update the documentation, which I shared before. Right now it shows a custom Nginx code that you need to add uh, to, your, like, to Nginx or other reverse proxy to support subdomains. We will update those docs to show the like one liner how to set up Go IPFS so it's supported natively. And we will be like much more uh, specific and prescriptive when you want to use a uh, uh, path gateway and when you want to use a uh, subdomain gateway, uh, highlighting the lack of origin isolation in the path ones. So those will not go away. Uh, they are super use useful and like. Even if you are running like DNS link website, 
with uh, this work I did in Go, uh, Go IPFS, it's possible to like mount path gateway under your under the DNS link origin of your website. So if you are the owner of uh, this specific origin, you want to consume uh, IPFS path gateway. Uh, so th th there are use cases. We will improve the code documentation around that. Uh, another question, uh, existing non-PL public gateways, do they need to do anything to upgrade besides upgrading to 0.5? Uh, yes and no. So uh, when they upgrade to 0.5, the only change happens on localhost. So the only thing that will be set up out of the box is a subdomain gateway on the localhost host name. If you use uh, the IP uh, 127.0.0.1, that will continue to be the path gateway. However, if you use the localhost uh, human readable name, uh, that will start uh, hosting the subdomains if you open it from the uh, web browser. If you load it from uh, some tools, it will continue to working as a path gateway. Uh, do they need to do anything to upgrade? If they are running only a, sub, uh, only a path gateway right now, they, they will be able to enable subdomain gateway for a specific host name, which of, of their choosing, with one line. Uh, and in GoIPFS documentation of the config, um, we already, I believe, provide some uh, recipes. <laughs> Uh, it's already merged, so it's in master. So there is, is uh, in, it, yep. Is there, is there a reason to not have this on by default for specific user agent strings? Well, hard, you, hard coding specific user agent strings, uh, it's tricky because you always forget about one. If you hard code browser names, you ignore like niche browsers. If you hard code curl or wget, you will ignore other users. And for example, BSD does not have curl or uh, wget, they use fetch, uh, which, which is common line tool, and it does not set a user agent at all. So mm, it's, I wonder, what, yeah. what, if, what if we, I, I'm just like looking down the three to five year on this and being like, we, the majority of usage is probably going to be browsers from a gateway perspective. And maybe we do something like we actually have a, a, a header required to be set by non-browser tools in order to get to enable path gateways. Because my concern is that people, if people are opening up public gateways and they're not reading the documentation, the default experience is, is pretty unsafe and will always default to path-based gateway for browsers. And browsers is most likely always going to be the lion's share, like the massive, massive, massively overwhelm any type of tool-based request. So I feel like that looking at the longer term security story for IPFS, we are erring on the side of a very small number of tools over a very large number, the security of a very large number of end users. And I'm not sure that that's the right calculus to make uh, for, oh, for it's that a, it's, long term. It's a very good point. Uh, right now we are focusing on just enabling people to start using uh, subdomains on localhost. Basically, we want people who are users of IPFS desktop and IPFS companion to get that origin isolation. In the future, we want to do, uh, we want to do uh, at least uh, one thing, uh, disable cookies and local storage on path gateways and make it an explicit flag if someone wants to like, restore that. that. That's a great mitigation. Uh, and another uh, that that's one thing and another thing will be more like more strict version would be doing uh, what you, you just described like making that like opt in uh, for a paths uh, but we are not there yet we would need to like make analysis of how people use yeah. that on the back end but uh, definitely we we want to move into that direction of sec being secure by default on the web and that's also like why we like ask people uh, to enable subdomains for a specific host name. That is because uh, you are not able to enable both subdomain and path gateway on the same host name. The subdomain will always redirect. You are not able to like abuse the fact that 
you can inject something using paths. Um, that's why the configuration looks uh, the way it looks. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, doing that and also like adding some access controls to our API are the biggest struggle for people who expose like Go IPFS on the web. But going back to questions <laughs> um, uh, to upgrade. Yeah, so uh, for example, uh, Cloudflare, they already provide subdomain gateway, but they have a custom config in Nginx. So they will, uh, what all they will need to do will be upgrade and then, oh gosh, I lost it. Yeah, and then uh, enable uh, this like one liner uh, for their host name and that's it. Um, so um, it should be uh, pretty painless. Uh, and we expect more and more people having that one like one line experience to run subdomain gateways. Uh, the only caveat here is to use a different host name if you are already using the domain or upgrade that domain to being a subdomain one. Uh, anything needed for IPFSIO after upgrade? Uh, do we do weird stuff there? Yes, we do. We we do everything there. We have a path gateway. We have a bunch of web DNS link websites and IPFS IO itself, like the, the root domain name is also DNS link website. And actually it was super useful that we did that because when I was designing those gateway receipts and the way it can be configured, you are able to use DNS link for the root and mount either path gateway or subdomain gateway on top of it and content addressed paths always like so, take a priority on top of dns link so probably more details here uh, but uh, the existing configuration is that so that we can continue doing uh, what we are doing on ipfsio and we don't expect any change there uh, IPFSIO will continue to be a path, ga path ga base uh, gateway for now. The DWeb link will be the subdomain one. We are still uh, thinking: should we uh, for like force the redirect in a web browser from IPFSIO to DWeb link? Uh, that that's a separate conversation. Probably for we need to check in with the Bifrost team first to understand the full ramifications of that change. For now, we just upgrade the web link to use this native support. Uh, next question, are more local host issues, bugs in browsers affecting us here? There is one uh, pre pretty big uh, thing that remains to be a problematic. It's uh, subdomain support in Firefox and the way uh, subdomains in Firefox on localhost are not secure context yet. So uh, I, I'll link, I'll, I'll put a link to issue with details uh, after the call, but uh, gist is that uh, historically only the localhost IP was secure context, but over time web browser vendors started interpreting local host host name as a secure context because they hard coded that to point at the local uh, IP, which made it actually secure. So no one can like overwrite the destination IP uh, at the DNS level. Uh, the, the problem is like uh, in Chrome, uh, all subdomains are secure context uh, under local host. Uh, in Firefox, local host itself is secure context, but no, subdomains under that are not. But there is an, an open uh, issue in uh, Bugzilla about like finishing that migration to hard coding local host. And when they finish that, uh, I, I've seen like movement last week. Uh, I believe the subdomains will start being interpreted as a secure context. Uh, I, I just did not uh, feel that we should like wait with subdomain uh, gateway support until Firefox uh, ships that, because that may be like in next release. For now, the only problem is uh, you may see that uh, here, actually, here is this padlock, and it says connection that's secure. So if I open the same resource from localhost in uh, in uh, Chromium, it will not have this crossed padlock. It will say, "Yeah, it's fine." <laughs> So that's the, the only, uh, the only uh, like an open issue I see right now. Um, 
will uh, other oh, oh yeah so like other bugs in browsers affecting us here uh, not, nothing comes to mind uh, there's there was like one uh, one problem with uh, there's this header called clear site data it's a header which a server can send to a web browser and tell it to purge all cookies all like cache everything for this specific origin and I had this discussion with Hugo uh, Hugo uh, before uh, that, that there's interesting fact that if you go to like the support, it's fine, it's fine, but then what? what? This exec execution context. So execution context may forces all the tabs to reload after you receive that header. So that does not work everywhere. And also like in, in Chromium, the wildcard does not work. So what we do on the subdomain uh, gateway, when you load a path and you receive a redirect from a path, just to be sure, we we send this header to ensure the cache, the cookies and the local storage. Uh, yeah, there's like the, the storage uh, are purged from the origin without subdomain. This is pretty like low level stuff, but important from a security standpoint. It means even if there's like a, a gap, if we made a mistake and someone loaded like JavaScript or something, uh, from the path somehow still the browsers will respect this header and remove all cookies and all storage and under storage is important uh, it's not just storage it's all the new apis like access uh, to indexdb service worker registration uh, so it's like pretty pretty uh, powerful stuff and we like will send that header to just to be sure so those are like uh, only uh, like edge cases or things to be uh, aware of. Uh, and last question: Will you be will I will be be willing to write a blog post? Uh, I believe uh, there either there is or it's in my notes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I PR this. Uh, there will for sure we will uh, have an update in the docs, but there will be a dedicated uh, blog post about subdomains. I want to. Uh, give some uh, it will include uh, like user stories for people who run a gateway right now and want to upgrade uh, for people who run uh, who are like IPFS companion users and want to understand it better uh, explain what's changed in the URLs and things like that so yeah for sure I'll stop talking now <laughs> uh, just like let me check if there's like uh, any question okay it's cool I agree <laughs> Uh, that's it from me. Uh. All right, I, I think this next one is me. I want to do a quick pass and let people talk about their uh, goals for the upcoming quarter, which is less than a week away, I think, at this point. Uh, just under. So we have um, share the screen. You can find for sure. I know that we have Vashko and Lytle here. They both have some plans for the next quarter. Uh, Vashko, you want to tell us a little bit about where you ended up for the most important things for Q2? Yeah, so uh, here, Star, I talked about this before where I can give us a fast insight. Basically, uh, it was planned to start uh, uh, this, this quarter, Q1. And I started it, but uh, basically the scope of it got uh, bigger than expected before, and uh, we needed to go into Q2, and this is my main uh, goal now. Basically, the big goal for this in the browser's context will be the connectivity with uh, uh, nodes on a second start of a node will be way faster, because we will already have the peers that you, we know, and we don't need to discover them. This will eventually open other opportunities outside the browser scope. For example, uh, if we have peers that we already know, we might not need to go and connect to the bootstrap nodes, which will be cool as well, but for another context. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, in the second part, there is I have a P0, which is uh, from uh, uh, refactoring our current code 
to then persist and uh, add the keybook as well to the second part, which will eventually just be spec for the Q2. But the goal with that will be to also improve the uh, performance of uh, dials through multi other confidence and peer scoring. Uh, then I have other two uh, less priority goals for this quarter. Basically, one of them is related with the user experience. Uh, in uh, JSLU P2P, we are having uh, one of the biggest pain points of users. It's always uh, around configuration. And so we are going to move in a completely different approach in configuration. There is also already one issue if any of you want to discuss with us. So Jacob already made a proposal and we will probably be trading on that. And finally, uh, the other one will be regarding uh, uh, the Libre2P node flows, because uh, this is one of the things that we discussed before with Lidl as well. Uh, we need to have a list of all the possible flows that a node has so that we understand what should be the, the, the priorities that we have to improve because we sometimes might be working on stuff that is not that priority because we don't foresee what are the most used cases for a node and it's good to have it listed. Uh, I can also talk by, by Jacob uh, as I synced with him. So um, Jacob's main uh, goal will be around the Lipid P crypto. So this is because uh, we have uh, no, um, Lipid P noise, which was implemented by Node Factory on a grant, but they are using a, um, basically a crypto li library, which is uh, a really pain for our bundle as it will grow like maybe twice the size that it's already have. And uh, we don't want to do that. So be before we go into enabling noise by default in uh, JSLP2P and consequently JSIPFS, uh, we want to basically move our Lip2P crypto in a modular way where you, can, you uh, can choose what pieces that you want to have and not like bring all the crypto just for a minor set of things that you might need to use. This will be eventually just for more power users until we get to like a really easy uh, document which uh, uh, new users can uh, like easily get. Then uh, the other one uh, for Jacob is multi-other resolvers. Uh, we have this issue for a while. Basically, we need to be able from a multi-other to just resolve it, uh, its DNS content. And we currently don't have that. Uh, and it will be extremely important for, uh, uh, for example, we, we have currently an issue on uh, WebRTC deploy because of that. And uh, the remaining one, uh, it's something that already came from uh, Q1, which is the WebRTC signaling and the con direct connection upgrade specs. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, about the, the peer store improvements, Who, who's the best person? Um, like, should we engage our collaborators to be able to test, test that early? Uh, I know with Go IP Fest, we have like the early testing program. Um, would, would it be worth talking to folks like Freebox or other people that we know uh, that are shipping uh, DS IP Fest in the browser as part of their default stack to do early testing of this as it comes available? Um, so uh, in an initial, plan. I already talked with Hugo and uh, we will be working on uh, test ground uh, simulations for uh, this, the metrics for this. There is like how it is nowadays and how it will be after the peer store improvements. But at least I wouldn't say that uh, for the initial four milestones it would be useful because it will be just a question of the second start of the node. But when we start talking about the multi other confidence and peer scoring, that's uh, where I think it would be cool to have uh, input from people because by the time we will probably need to tweak uh, uh, some configurations of the peer scoring functions and it might be good to have feedback. So I would say just for the second part, the multi-other confidence in peer okay, scoring. Cool, thanks. The lib P2P config improvements, uh, this is something where um, I don't know how what the you know t-shirt sizing for this is, but the feedback that we've gotten from our collab interview so far is that this is a this as you said something people are really really comes up in conversations. So 
Uh, I'd love to be able to see if we can make this in sooner rather than later. So if it is a, if there's a, a priority discussion here, we have direct input from collabs around the importance of any config improvements. Um, I, I wonder too, is are these, it would be good to have more detail around what type of config improvements because um, we've kind of had, we've had conversations multiple times around same defaults for, for web versus non-web use cases and, and things like that and how we don't have those really easily set up. Uh, it would be great if we had a better a view into what these config improvements are. Maybe you could link to an issue or something like that. Yeah, I will link to the issue. But yes, one of the things that we want to do is precisely that, to get a browser's better way of doing things instead of just uh, as we currently do, mostly go for notes defaults and that's it. We want to definitely go on a way where we put the good defaults for each runtime that we have. And I will point the link because we already discussed that in the issue. Okay, that's awesome. Great to hear that that's part of it. Uh, Mr. Lytle, can you tell us what you're going to do this next quarter. Yeah, it's it's still a work in progress, but overall, it I I see it like like a maintenance quarter. So uh, uh, on the subdomain uh, part, uh, I did not finish the J, uh, JS implementation. JS also provides HTTP gateway, um, so part of this could be uh, like extending this to uh, adding interop tests for a gateway. I don't think we have it right now. It could be like an opt-in because not every IPFS implementation would have HTTP gateway, but if it chooses to implement it, there should be like a test suit for that. So that maybe I may change the, the first one to like extend uh, and include that as a part of uh, having a second implementation. And instead of writing tests in JS IPFS repo, I would uh, write those in uh, interop one. Uh, that another thing is like the paying off technical debt uh, in uh, IPFS companion. Uh, it's still using the old APIs, need to switch to the new ones. Uh, clean up addressing stuff, that's both internal and external. Uh, on the internal side, we, we got like addressing specs in multiple places. We need to coalesce them, close all the issues which are years old um, and uh, something I wrote down uh, what is uh, IPNS resolution uh, is possible in web browser uh, but I'm, I made like merge it with something else because uh, the overarching plan for the quarter for me is like making self-hosting easy for people who want to use IPFS as a par as a building block for of their web app and what I mean by that is like People are running JSIPFS in their web app. And that JSIPFS needs some bootstrap servers. And people use the default ones, which are hosted by IPFS project, because it may not be clear or easy to set up their own. They may be using WebRTC or uh, Stardust transport uh, and signaling. Uh, and they use the default one because it's there and it's not easy, clear or easy to, to do that. I know Jacob and Vashko are doing it super, super much easier by creating Docker images and stuff like that. Uh, but we have a problem of not having DHT in a web browser so that JSIPFS may not be able to do everything. For example, resolve IPNS. <laughs> um, so that's why I probably merged those everything under like more clear uh, roadmap, but uh, for that we may leverage delegated routing modules and people should be able to host their own preload nodes, uh, delegated routing modules, so that will include like fixing uh, w w what's missing in Go IPFS uh, and then going through that, ensuring everything works, not just it's written down that like actually doing the thing and uh, not putting it and, and then writing down uh, sort of like a cookbook for someone who would like to, to use it and like self-host as much as possible. It, of course, in web browser context, it will never be like 100% distributed, but you may make it like 100% federated uh, and then like 
grew from, from that. So that's like my, uh, it's a draft version, uh, but that's the overall idea. Cool, thanks, thanks for sharing. I, I really appreciate it. Both you and, and Vasco included things about documenting how some of these connection types work and how some of the user flows and access pathways work. And this is really, really gonna be important as we, as we start doing, improving the documentation around that. And um, you know, Jessica did some work on the, on the audit this quarter, which really showed us how important and impactful any type of that, uh, any, any more of that work is going to be. So I think we, we wanna lean into doing more of that and probably in the second half of the year. So setting up these, the documentation of how, how, these, how these things work is gonna be uh, more important, especially as we say, bring in external visualizers and illustrators and people who are gonna do work around communicating these complex concepts. Uh, effectively and visually. So thanks for including that. Even even though it's the lower priority, uh, this also might be the kind of thing where um, if, we're, if we're really pulling back a little bit this quarter on some of these bigger, harder projects, leaving time for, for flexible things or creative things or time to write things down, uh, these might be some places where it'd be fun to maybe even organize some group documentation hacking sessions where we try to write out some of these scenarios. Um, it was really fun to be able to like I took that one spreadsheet and I just tried to think of all the different ways that every permutation of how somebody might get on or off or connected to the IPFS network. And uh, very few were documented so far. There was really nothing to point to for a lot of this. So that it's cool that this sh is showing up in the quarterly goals. Uh, any other questions that folks have for Vasco, Lytle, and... Uh, the Vasco proxy to Jacob since he couldn't make it today. Cool. I'm going to stop sharing then. Now I have so many open desktops. I'm unable to find one with all the faces. I see you now. <laughs> oh, the glory. Uh, this, this next one is me too. The minor update from Opera. Uh, it's going to ship. 57 is going to ship. Instead of this week, it's going to ship next week. So uh, we should expect Monday, the current plan is that uh, Opera Android will ship with IPFS support. And um, I'll hopefully have a blog post up in time for that. Uh, next one is me as well. Just a link to Agalia made some comments on the protocol handler PR. So this is our first kind of foray working with them. Um, a small projects to, that will hopefully lead to bigger projects. Uh, but these are experts in um, and landing stuff in the core code ba in the core code bases of Chromium WebKit and uh, Gecko, so it's interesting to see their perspective when they're evaluating the type of changes that we're proposing. The web extensions, any changes to web extensions, is has an extra layer of awesome complexity because it's a group of browsers that are standardizing around the technology that's offered by one browser that refuses to standardize. So you have a very interesting market or standardization dynamic there. It's a useful learning opportunity because uh, the PR Dietrich linked, uh, it's a draft of the open grant. It's not finished yet. We are like discussing and adding more context there. Uh, so it's something we will do, we are doing in the open <laughs> uh, in the hope that uh, it will be useful enough to get merged, if not upstream, at least by some vendors who are built on top of Chromium. Um, any update on Brave local discovery? Yes, I got an update. Uh, the person who will be uh, deliver, uh, like implementing uh, that uh, as a part of uh, DevGrant is currently working on a project uh, related to uh, COVID-19 and that ends around uh, in the, after two weeks of uh, April, I believe. So, uh, around that time, uh, that work will start. Uh, uh, yeah. You're muted. I was, yeah, I was telling to Chris, who is also muted, <laughs> that now it's, oh, uh, yeah. Do you want to show us something? Yeah, I'll show it real quick. It's, um, let's see, here it is. So not exactly IPFS specific, but um, I, I, I hang out mostly with the IPLD guys. And uh, 
they have the schema defined if you don't know. And um, I just threw together a very simple web app that allows you to edit IPLD schema and then it will syntax highlight it and even um, show errors. And so if I come in here and type a uh, invalid type comment, it'll parse it and show the error right up here. So just a very simple little web app that I thought I'd show it since IPLD doesn't really have much of a UI associated with it since it's kind of underneath the hood, but that's it. That's pretty cool. I wonder, because uh, we got uh, IPLD Explorer, which uh, gives a very basic ability of traversing the, the tree. Uh, but uh, like, it, it's uh, on a back burner, but always we've been discussing uh, uh, that it would be really cool to move that, if we move that project further, to give uh, ability for people to create like arbitrary Cbor DAGs or things like that. Uh, and it's super useful to see that experimentation in that space. Yep. Thank you. And the last one is Safari changes to storage. Let me share. It will be more interesting if I share. <laughs> um, now, I'm unable to share for some reason. Yeah, so I saw I saw these changes come out, and uh, it, it, I think it's interesting because it shows a trend away on, on Apple, a trend away from uh, definitely. I mean, always they they block third party cookies, but also around other vectors for for a third party to be able to track you uh, and and having unsecure access to things like storage. Uh, and more interestingly, in, in this comment about r really pushing people towards requesting access. And I feel like, you know, we have this conversation about how JSIPFS right now doesn't request for storage access, for permanent storage access. So it can be blown away. If you clear private data, all your IPFS local repos and web pages are, are gone, gone forever. Uh, complete and total data loss. But the model of IPFS doesn't really talk about that data in that way. So as somebody who's a web app builder, for example, who instantiates JSIPFS on their web page, and the user starts pinning and storing data there, they don't have that expectation that that data is temporary or we will be blown away. Um, so there's, for us, there's a risk that IPFS looks like it is either handling data cavalierly or that your data is not safe or stored if you're using IPFS inside of a web page and not stored correctly. So I, I'm really interested. I, I mean, I'm in favor generally of just asking for permanent data storage access as a default for JSIPFS. And I mean, that's a big decision, a pretty big change in how the library is operated so far. But I'm pointing towards things like this as examples of how that's kind of the end state that we're going to see anyway. If we want a um, web page to be a first class application platform, that's what native apps had to do. And they have to request access to local storage. And that's part of their permissions model. So this explicit ask up front, um, I think in the long term, will lead to IPFS being treated more. Uh, more seriously and trusted more eventually by users if we set up these expectations of that their data is actually safe when they're using it inside a web page. And then the people building on top of us, like the textiles and the three box and things like that, people who, who are shipping things inside of a web page also have these types of this expectation set up by default. Um, and there's no, no, the really reduces the gap for misunderstanding the safety or treatment of locally stored data. Uh, until we get sync primitives where people have different expectations around whether we live generally, but we don't really have a sync story yet with IPFS. So this, if you're using it in web page, this is kind of the only place that your data is going to be. This is super, super relevant uh, to the discussions that I had in the past two weeks. Uh, so I invented like created an issue about persistent storage in web browsers, just so we have like a dumping We're ground all for but all, the mind all the... continues. <laughs> um, so like, like some details and thoughts uh, on, on that in, in, in this issue, which I added to, to notes. Uh, however, it's this change proposed by Safari, it's probably the, the, the final push uh, to start thinking about uh, leveraging the fact that there may be multiple IPFS nodes on 
in web browser or on the user's machine. We may at, at some point those uh, limitations in a browser context without like a browser extension or a native support of IPFS uh, may get so like so severe to the point that JS IPFS node running in a browser page context is always like a, just an ephemeral cache and it, even its identity is as well ephemeral. It may disappear after seven days and we are not able to do much in that regard. However, if we start thinking about uh, creating uh, user experiences around uh, IPFS nodes uh, discovering each other and maybe JS IPFS running in a web browser asking uh, IPFS desktop node, hey, I got this data. I would like you to persist that because I'm not trustworthy. <laughs> uh, definitely that's the space we, we will have to explore. And I, f I feel with like announcements like this, we are getting like step by step closer there. Um, and we may and we may explore that. Uh, I, I had a discussion with Firaki about the nodes, like le le the duplicating nodes, and also uh, synchronizing data, asking like uh, nodes uh, uh, asking each other to persist on data. Uh, right now, when I talked with people who are using uh, JSIPFS in a web browser, but they have a regular web app which has a backend what people do is they effectively already use JSIPFS running in a web browser. Uh, they use it uh, in, in that ephemeral fashion. So they don't assume that to be something permanent. They don't even care about peer ID of that specific uh, node running in a browser. They just care about like IPFS add, IPFS cut, get, uh, and they get uh, other data, they get CID, and then they immediately are either connected to bootstrap nodes or preload nodes on their backend, which they self host. Uh, and then on the, the, the persistence happen on the backend. So there may be a middleware which takes that CAD and pins it like at Pinata or some pinning service or maybe like self hosted pinning service. But that's the pattern I observe that like people sort of like already don't have too much trust in uh, that local storage or they always like web developers always think about this storage as an ephemeral and if they need anything to persist more than one, one a few days uh, they usually uh, have additional like orchestration on the back end uh, so that's will be interesting both making it easier for people to self-host that's like the q2 priority for me of sorts uh, will be to uh, to make it like easier for people to, to enable that sort of orchestration, that's like a short term. And the long term, probably IPFS project in a web browser could do much more uh, in the regard of uh, people leveraging uh, like a desktop node or a native support that exists in the browser or an operating system at some point. Uh, those are my like, thoughts on, on, on this. I, 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 we, we won't be able to fight this. And the, the direction that the current climate around like privacy, those are very valid concerns. And uh, that storage will get more and more ephemeral. Yeah. I think it's a really, really interesting idea to use this as, as one, I mean, really leaning harder into actually taking advantage of the features that web makes available instead of seeing them as, as difficult barriers, but also as, as a way to direct people towards desktop installs and of, of full nodes. Like it feels like we could probably do both, um, or at the very least should should explore both. But I think that the work that we're going to do into uh, unifying the desktop companion workflow and experience um, coming into this next couple of quarters will really support our ability to actually realistically point people towards that as a solution. And I think like for for now, like uh, don't know that that's something that I would want everybody who builds on top of IPFS to all do that in a, in a, in a, in a big way. Cause I don't think it's quite ready for that, that type of workflow yet. Uh, especially an end user experience who is not an IPFS user already. But, uh, 
like there's there's a lot TBD and yeah and, and and thanks for writing this summary up because it's really important like you said it is inevitable uh, that that is the end game that we are seeing for for storage and access on the web and then as much as we can do to prepare for the worst possible uh, environment like uh, assuming that the worst environment that we have to run in is only going to get worse and preparing for for the, the most limited capability there and, and merely maximizing the experience and designing for that from from the get-go is going to be important. Yeah, I, I believe like uh, we may at some point end up with uh, some way of uh, describing states of uh, like JSIPFS node running on a page. That node will probably have a, like this the basic state will be ephemeral. And then it, it, if it's able to like have some means of persistent storage that may be like a local Go IPFS or it may be like a service uh, and like talking with a service over the P2P. Uh, that remains to be seen, uh, but there will be probably some sort of like a state for web developers to, it, it will make it easier for web developers to reason about it uh, if we uh, have that sort of like an abstraction. We are at the end of the agenda. Any ad hoc questions, discussions, feelings, concerns? So many. But as always, nice to see you all here. This meeting is always a, a roller coaster of exciting things. And terrifying <laughs> things. Like, hey, guess what? The deployment channels that we ship stuff on just radically reduce our ability to do that. Hey, good times. That, that beta channel we had. If it's, if it's not, if it's not one thing, it's another in browser world. Never a dull day. All right, take care, y'all. See you. See you.